This week, Portugal has been playing host to what's commonly known as the Bilderberg Meeting. The Bilderberg Meeting, also known as the Bilderberg Group, according to Wikipedia, is an annual off-the-record conference established in 1954 to foster dialogue between Europe and North America. The group's agenda, which was allegedly to prevent another world war originally, has now been defined as bolstering consensus around free market Western capitalism and, here's the tricky part, its interests around the globe. That apparently includes fighting a war with Russia and Ukraine. For more on that, we spoke with journalist Tony Gosling, who just happens to be in the beautiful city of Lisbon for the Bilderberg meeting, and he's been in attendance this week. We spoke with him via Skype from Lisbon on Friday. So, Tony, you've been there for a few days now. You've had a chance to look around and see what's going on. Tell us, what's going on? Okay, well, this is really, I think, uh, you know, I, I quit journalism. Well, I was booted out of the BBC just, <laughs> uh, well, you know, in 1992. And then I spent, I, re- I read a bit of Chomsky. I saw <clears throat> Manufacturing Consent. And um, then I realized, well, look, hang on a minute. The media is much more manipulated than I realized. And, you know, I was in there wondering what was going on. And, and, and only after I left, uh, or I was uh, elbowed out, you know, then I realized this is a very peculiar business. And <clears throat> so I was there uh, up until about 93. Then I got stuck into the Bilderbergers, because for me, this is a journalistic paradise here. This is the, the proof that actually you can control the narrative in the whole of the Western world, pretty much, uh, if you can control the press. And we've got actually inside there more journalists not writing about what's going on in this top level NATO summit um, than any of the journalists on the outside. There's two or three maybe photographers outside, there's you know, some people doing some little documentaries and things like that. But the ones inside, Don, are sworn to secrecy. Uh, and when you've got the warmongers, effectively, you know, the NATO Secretary General, uh, the Ukrainian Foreign Minister, an incredible selection of European politicians here, uh, then, you know, obviously we need to know what's going on. These people right. are telling us that they're only here as in, a, in a personal, individual, personal capacity. Well, that's clearly not happening. This is a, a major uh, EU and British NATO countries uh, a, a military summit, and um, we're not being told anything about what's going on inside. Well, let's start with what what the group actually is. Yeah, you know, it has like sort of like a Rothschild kind of mystique word when people throw about the Bilderbergs, but it, it's actually a real group with real people, and they're feasting on real, you know, pheasant under glass or whatever, and planning the world. Well, okay, so I looked at it deeply into the origins of this. The first thing that kind of got me going was realizing that the chairman of the Bilderberg from 1954, when it started 10 years after World War II, uh, up until the mid-1970s when he was booted out for corruption, was Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, who was a former SS officer. So this organization was really founded uh, by the SS, I would suggest. And I mean, mm. many people have pointed out that Bernhard was basically spying for the Nazis, even though he'd married into the Dutch royal family in Supreme Headquarters Allied Forces Europe with the British and the Americans pushing uh, rather belatedly after the Russians had done all the legwork uh, towards Berlin at the end of the war. So, you know, that was what really got me interested in this group. And the fact that it is so incredibly secretive. I mean, I said we've got a lot of politicians here. Those politicians really in the United States, that would quite possibly be a criminal offence under the Logan Act for them to be sitting in there. But we've got three European uh, NATO zone prime ministers We've got the Finnish, the Danish and the Dutch prime ministers all in there from Canada um, and from Holland. We've got the deputy prime ministers. So you've got the absolute top of the Dutch uh, political system sitting in there with these NATO guys uh, and the banks, banksters. Uh, Plus, you've got minor, well, not minor ministers. I mean, for example, the British MI5, MI6 minister is in Mm. there. Uh, We've got the Germans, the Austrians, Ukrainians, two French senior ministers, the Spanish and the Irish. Uh, and this is actually, you know, that what the Logan Act was set up to stop anything like this happening, where you've got a private lobby under the Chatham House rules and none of the participants, those um, 
journalists and politicians who've gone in there are actually sworn never to uh, reference anything that's been spoken about at the conference as if it never happened, Don. Journalists? Well, what role would a journalist have if they can't talk about what they witnessed? Well, the idea is that they will then promulgate uh, the ideas that are in there. For example, they will write puff pieces on the people that you know, say Henry Kissinger or Eric Schmidt, who, who are the some major people in the Bilderberg these days, uh, that's what they'll do. They will then write these great things about all these people are, are f- so fantastic. They're sorting out the solutions to artificial intelligence, to the global financial system, whereas actually what's really going on, as we know with Henry Kissinger and his war criminal record, is these people have been creating these crises in the first place. So they're trying to play both sides of the chessboard, Don. Yeah, and they've got to dig up 100 candles for his birthday next week, too. Um, you know, the, the function you describe, of course, is not that of a journalist, but uh, people use the word scribe, but what we used to call a stenographer. In other words, they speak, you write it down, and, and distribute it among you know the masses. Like, that's what's going on there. Exactly, and um, so they aren't really journalists at all, in my view, uh, in, in, in terms of their commitment to the readers. Their commitment is to the shareholders, Uh, and to the bosses in the businesses that they run. And really, we're living in this incredibly, well, I mean, we've got a lot of freedoms in the West, but I can tell you, finance capitalism is eating away at those freedoms all the time. Uh, Every time, we we don't recognize it, but but that's what's happening. I mean, the press is being bought up by private equity and uh, and shut down if it says, I mean, look at what's happened to Tucker Carlson. I mean, he's just another victim of this uh, very egregious system that anybody that's really on the side of the viewers and listeners and the readers just gets literally shot in there. Well, not quite literally, but they, they will get taken out. Well, some of them do. If they're saying the wrong thing, apparently. Some of them do get taken out. We have, you know, the journal that uh, uh, Dugan's daughter do, uh, it got got blown up in Moscow. Uh, the uh, the uh, military. Web- yeah, the, the journalist. Famous Gary Webb exposing the links between the U.S. intelligence, uh, uh, Iran-Contra and all that stuff. You know, literally, they are sometimes. You're right, quite right. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, uh, yep, and Serena, um, Sh- Sharin, yep, this mean, all, yeah. Uh, the uh, the other thing is there's interesting stuff they're talking about China, for example. Uh, although there's no Chinese in there, this is very much a NATO lobby. Uh, so the work that I did uh, on my book, The Traitors of Arnhem, exposes this battle in the Second World War. Uh, which was a a complete defeat for the Allies, particularly the British. And the Nazis won it, which gave them an extra three months or so in order to squirrel away their wealth at the end of World War II. This is the famous film, A Bridge Too Far. And after that that battle uh, and after the war, what happened is uh, Hitler's private secretary, Martin Bormann, and Winston Churchill's private secretary, Desmond Morton, uh, met up. And all of the wealth, pretty much, from Nazi Germany, which had been squirreled away in the months after that battle. Uh, and the, the amazing thing is that, you know, you've got people who were chairing the Bilderberg after the war were actually the people who threw that fight and allowed the Nazis to squirrel their wealth away. So they ended up creating a kind of Fourth Reich, a financial Fourth Reich. And one of the greatest writers on it is a guy called Paul Manning from CBS during World War II. Right. After the war, wrote a book called Martin Bormann, Nazi in Exile, and explained exactly what happened. Bormann was down there. He set up these 750 companies around the world, mostly in Europe and the U.S., and uh, into that money was um, secreted the laundered cash from uh, the looting of Europe by the Nazis through Sullivan and Cromwell, the Dulles Brothers law firm in New York. And so that's basically what we're dealing with today, I think. The origins were in Hitler's Third Reich, this new Fourth Reich, a financial Fourth Reich, with using banks instead of tanks. <laughs> I mean, the, the the things that happened in the, in the aftermath of World War II, we're looking at some of that today, by the way. If you look at what happened after they blew up Libya, suddenly the gold evaporated. We have no idea what happened. Uh, the, the gold that was belonged to Venezuela, that was in, in London and, and, and elsewhere in Europe, that, that all evaporated. Um, the, the, here and there, people will appoint someone to endorse checks that are made out against, say, Juan Guaido, for example. Uh, here, there's a billion-dollar check uh, that belongs to Venezuela. Could you endorse the back of this, please, for us? And here's 50 bucks for you. I mean, th- this is th- the stealing... And the the laundering of stolen wealth, it, it, it's like the foundation of the economic, of the financial uh, system that is the foundation of the economic system of the West. 
Yeah, the, um, one of the most interesting things about actually coming to these, I would recommend it to absolutely anyone to come along. Uh, obviously, Lisbon's a beautiful city. It's great to spend a bit of time yeah. here. But it's to see the entertaining situations that develop when Bilderbergers turn up, but they don't pass the initial security checks. So the car is taken aside and they sit in there for a while, usually five or ten minutes. It starts to get a bit hot, maybe. And then they have to get out. And, of course, then suddenly uh, loads of photographs are taken of them. We even had uh, the British uh, MP, David Lammy, who's uh, well-placed to be a senior figure in the new Labour government when uh, Conservatives get booted out next year, Don. Right. I mean, he is. Uh, this is what they do. They, look at, they, they try and get the politicians who are going to have power in the future. And uh, he was hiding behind a bush. Uh, a friend of ours, Giorgio, <laughs> had to point out to the security who came out to find him that, oh, he's hiding behind that bush over there and he's trying to chat, chat to you on, a, on the phone. So they had to lead the security to go and find this uh, British MP who was hiding away from everybody because he couldn't get into the conference. So this is the kind. And also a very interesting ch uh, chatting to the Kravis uh, uh, wife. and uh, Right. Uh, They're uh, both there, right, yeah. Yeah, she's a uh, you know she's a major figure in the arts, and uh, yeah, yeah. Charlie was asking her. He said, "Oh, are you looking forward to the conference?" And she looked at him and she said, "Well, no." <laughs> and so you do wonder, don't you, uh, yeah. what's going on in there? Well, these people are being caught, sort of caught up in a web. Some of them, yeah, uh, that they can't kind of wriggle free of. We, we, you know, the, ultimately we're looking now. And uh, people like Sandy Adams down in Glastonbury have pointed this out: a zero trust world. Things are being turned on their head. Yeah. We grew up on in a world where. The basic assumption was, uh, you know, you, you give everyone the benefit of the doubt. We have this kind of Christian moral attitude that uh, we're friendly to strangers, etc. Now, uh, everything, you've got to have a past to do this. And it, the idea is, and this is the whole basis of our relationship with other human beings. It's being turned on its head in the West. So I think that's an important thing to understand. The other thing is the accelerationist attitude here, which the idea is to create as many crises as you can right. and then to create a solution to the crisis, whether it's economic, COVID, uh, or whether it's Ukraine. I mean, there's climate, obviously, the migrant crisis, and you create a solution that either doesn't work or actually makes things far worse. Right. And that is a deliberate philosophy yeah. uh, put out by uh, various characters, including uh, Yuva. Well, I mean, Yuva Noah Harari picks up on it, and he, by the way, uh, is one of the most famous people in the world right now, a writer uh, who writes about AI, and uh, he's he's there, uh, right? He's mysteriously turned up yesterday. That's amazing. At, at Lisbon Airport, apparently nothing to do with the Bilderberg conference, so he's apparently not going to be here. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, this um, philosophy, the dark enlightenment, is I think behind a lot of this, and that's why many of the people that have been coming here for years, thinking it's a great conference, a lot of powerful people inside, and we're going to get more power if we come along. Many of them, I think, are now thinking, well, hang on a minute. What exactly have we gotten ourselves into here? <laughs> Definitely warmongering. Back in 2002, we got a leak out of the conference. One of the bar staff told us that uh, they were talking about in invading Iraq yeah. in the conference. And we were looking at each other. What the hell are you, are you talking about? We, we're not going to do that. And, of course, 2003, it happened in 99. Yep. Uh, again, a similar thing with Kosovo. So the leaks that come out from the bar staff are some of the most incredible things over the year where we can actually prove and, and stand up, although, of course, they, are, they want to be off the record saying these things. Uh, that we as journalists can say it, that it is most definitely a place to cook up the next world war. Tony, thank you so much for your time. And uh, let us know next week uh, what, how it sums up, and we'd love to speak with you again. Yeah, that'd be fine. And, and if people want to hear, we've got quite a lot of commentary. My site is thisweek.org.uk. Uh, and Charlie Skelton, just look for him. He's been doing some wonderful pieces around the world. He gets entertained. He's a comedy writer, and he gets entertained by these various ways that these Bilderbergers trip up. And he always goes for the jugular, for the top people, the Eric Schmitz and the Kissingers. Good. We will definitely check that out. For KPFK, I'm Don DeBar.